Well, God bless you. And today we certainly hope that you enjoyed the message because God is good. And one thing about the Word of God, it never goes out of style. It's never antiquated and it's never outdated. So thank you today for joining us and know this, that God loves you. He wants you to love Him like He loves you. Because not only is He with you here on earth, but He's going away to prepare a place for you that where He is, there you may be also. Enjoy the message today and do know God cares for you. None who is able to take us from where we are in the muck and the mire of life and set us up so that we can be called your children, so that we can be heirs and joint heirs with your son. God, we thank you for just loving us and keeping us and preserving us from evil and unrighteousness. And we pray now that as we expound upon your word, God, that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher, and that he will guide and direct us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Turn your Bibles to the book of Joshua, chapter number 14, verse number 6. Joshua, chapter number 14, verse number 6 through 15. Joshua, the book of Joshua. Shall we stand for the reading of God's Word? Verse number 6. Then the, children of his, then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, the Kenzanite, said unto them, Hmm. Thou knowest the thing that the Lord has said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee, Gadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people to do what? Melt. But what did I do? I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swear on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast done what? And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. And as yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to do what else? Amen. Now therefore, do what? Amen. Give me this mountain, whereof the Lord spake in that day, for thou hearest in that day how the Anakins were there, and that the cities were great and fenced, so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to do what? Drive them out. How? As the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh a Hebron for an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb the son of Jephunneh and the, the Kenzanite until this day because he did what? And the name of Hebron before was Karajaraharba, which Arba was a great man among the Anakims, and the land had rest from what? War. War. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to talk this morning from the thought. See it. Say it. 
and seize it. See it, say it, and seize it. If you can see it, you'll be able to talk about it, but that's not enough. You got to go seize it. You got to take it because how many of you know that anybody can talk? Anybody can dream, but it takes courage and fortitude. It takes sacrifice. It takes commitment to seize it. And one of the problems that we have is that when God gives us something, we got to be able to go seize it. Amen? When God wants to bless us, you got to know for sure that it is God, number one, but more importantly, you got to know that when God speaks, that it's going to happen. Now, as I gathered the, the information for this message this morning, I, I wanted to share with you that in this life, in this life, there are three levels of living. And the first level is the see it level, which is the bottom level. Most anybody can live at this level, and everybody has an opportunity to see it. Now, when I say see it, I'm not talking about visual actuality. I'm, I'm talking about faith opportunity. And some of us are so visually astute in some areas, but we are so blind to spiritual opportunities. So I want to share with you this morning that if, in fact, you are going to live your life out to its fullest extent, you've got to be able to see God's purpose for your life. You've got to come to the realization that where you are right now is not where God ultimately intends for you to be. You've got to understand that no matter at what level you are, this is not the highest that God has for you. You've got to see yourself beyond the present set of circumstances, be they good or bad, and say that God has more for me. I want everybody this morning to say, God has more for me. If you take the attitude that you can see it. And in order to see it, you have to be able to have a vision. The Bible says, without a vision, what happens? People perish. Without a vision, churches perish. Without a vision, homes will perish. Without a vision, jobs and, 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 and entrepreneurial endeavors will perish simply because you've got to be able to see what God has for you. And, and, and in the scriptures, it says, write the vision and do what else? Make it what? For what purpose? So that they that read it may run. But if the vision tarries, do what? Wait for it. Because the vision does not come to fruition the first two or three days, the first two or three months, or the first two or three years of your life, what you must do is wait on it. Don't give up because you've had a bump in the road. Don't give up because you've had setbacks. Know that you've got to see yourself where God wants you to be. In other words, that vision for your life, that purpose for your life, you have to become absorbed in that vision. You have to know for sure that this vision is for you. And when God gives you a vision, don't let knuckleheads and naysayers take your vision from you. Don't let a romantic moment ruin your future because God has a vision for you. Is anybody with me? Don't let uh, a moment of stupidity by doing something like drugs and like stealing or some things like that, that end, uh, you end up in, in, incarcerated. Don't let a moment of stupidity rob you of what you've seen for yourself. But first, you got to see it. You can never become what God wants you to become 
until you see yourself doing that. In the secular world, it's called visualization, but I don't want to talk about visualization because it brings on some other connotations. I want to say it the way God says, you got to have the vision. You got to think about that thing. And a lot of thoughts pass through your head, but you got to catch the one that's for you. A lot of thoughts go through your mind, but not every thought that goes through your mind is for you. And whatever God has for you, who is it for? If it's for you, then you are the only one that can stop your vision from coming to fruition. Yes, you may have come from a family that never had anybody to go to college, but if God says you can finish college and be an engineer, guess what? You can be an engineer. You may be the only one that started their own business enterprise and you may not have had anybody to tutor you or mentor you about business, but if God says that this business is for you, you can be a businessman, you can be a businesswoman, you can be a business person simply because God says it. But if you let the naysayers stop you, they will rob you of your dreams, they will rob you of your hope, they will rob you of your vision and then laugh at you because you didn't make it. You've got to be able to see yourself being where God wants you to be. Now, Caleb, and I want you to hear this good. Caleb was one of the two people uh, that started out with Moses that entered the promised land. But listen at this. The vision that got Caleb in the promised land wasn't even Caleb's vision. Caleb believed so much in the man of God that when he saw Moses come down to lead the children of Israel out of bondage, Caleb said, I can make his vision my vision. All I am now is a brick maker. All I am now is in bondage. All I am now is gathering straw. All I'm doing now is gathering straw. But when God sent Moses down to Egypt to bring them out of bondage, Caleb said, I didn't have a vision, but because God sent his man, I can take his vision. Sometimes your vision won't necessarily emanate out of you. You will have to join in with others for your vision to become reality. Come on, somebody. Sometimes you'll have to say, God, I don't know exactly what it is you wanted me to do. I know I'm playing a part in this role, in this puzzle. I don't know exactly where it is, but God, wherever it is, fit me in. So it wasn't even Caleb's vision, but because he believed the man of God, he saw God working through Moses. He saw God when the plagues came, when the, when the flies, when the mosquitoes, when the frogs, when the blood, water turned to blood, uh, when the firstborn died. Caleb was there. Caleb saw God working through Moses. And even though Moses didn't make it physically into the promised land, Caleb believed in the vision so much that he said, that's my vision. He believed it so much because a man of God delivered it to deliver people. And sometimes in catching a vision, you have to be not selfish, but selfless. Is anybody with me? Caleb said, Moses, the vision you have, I believe it. I can see it. I can see us in the promised land. I can see me in houses I didn't build. I can see me in, in eating from trees I, I didn't plant. I can see us, Moses. I can see us walking in the land that flows with milk and honey. And, and whatever you say that's necessary for us to get there, that's what it's going to take. But not only did Caleb see the vision, Caleb was able to speak the vision. When Caleb, along with 11 other spies, went out to spy the land, along with Joshua, there were 10 who brought a negative report. And the report was that we are in our own sight as grasshoppers. The majority report was we cannot make it. 
They will defeat us because the Anakims were there, and the Anakims were, in some cases, 10 feet tall. They were really the ancestors of Goliath, as it were. And so they intimidated people by their presence. Don't let circumstances intimidate you from getting the blessings that God has for you. If you know for a fact that God wants you to be a doctor, even though it takes med school and specialization and you don't have the money, if God says you can be a doctor, you can be a doctor. If God says that you can uh, be the president of your own company, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you are female. It doesn't matter your skin color. It doesn't matter your economic background. It doesn't matter any of those things. For the Bible says, I can do how many things? Through who? Who what? I want to deal with that for just a moment. If you can grab the essence of that, you can overcome any purpose God has uh, or that the devil is trying to stop you from getting the purpose that God has for you. In other words, if you can grab that I can do how many things? Through who? Now notice the order. The order is that I can do all things, not with stipulations, but I can do all things, but the things that I can do are through who? They're not through your own ingenuity. It's not through your own planning. It's through Christ. You have to put him in the front. He has to be the locomotion, the, 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 the locomotion, uh, not the locomotion. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> oh. <sighs> he has to be the one pulling the train. <laughs> He, 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 he can't be the caboose. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's pretty good. That's a Freudian, good Freudian slip. But anyway, he has to be in the front. He has to be the engine. He refuses to be the caboose in your life. So what you got to do is say, God, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What are some of the things you can do through Christ who strengthens you? Let's just start thinking about them. You can leave people who are going nowhere and become a somebody for God. Do I have a witness? You can lay down your bottle and your pipe and step over into righteousness and God can turn your whole life around. You can leave arenas where in fact you have been wallowing in the dirt and God through the blood of Jesus can cleanse you and make you purposeful and meaningful, give you meaningfulness in your life. God wants you to understand that you can do all things through Christ. You can be in the hospital and they can tell you you're not going to make it, but if you don't believe their report, you can make it. Is anybody hearing me today? Caleb not only saw the promised land, but he began to speak it. So when the spies went out, what happened was, 10 came back and said, we can't do it. But there were two. There was Caleb and Joshua. And Caleb and Joshua said, why are y'all saying this? God has already given the land to us. Why are you saying we can't do it when God has already said we can? Why is it? We're saying that we can't do some things when God's already said we can. God said we can lay hands on the sick and what will happen? They'll what? Recover. God also says, greater works than these shall you do, and Jesus raised folks from the dead. Why is it that God has already said we can do it, and yet we don't do it? It's because we're looking at the giants. Caleb says, y'all forget that. 
The people got mad at he and Joshua, but they didn't care about the people being angry. And let me just tell you the next thing. When you follow the vision that God has placed in your heart, when you speak it, not everybody around you, even though they go to church with you, even though they go bowling with you, even though they go to other places with you, won't necessarily agree with the vision that God has given you. But you've got to go on in spite of what anybody else has said. You know deep inside of your heart that God wants you to be on the top and not the bottom. God wants to bless you and you're not cursed. God wants you to be the head and not the tail. God wants you to be financially secure. And yet everybody around you keeps saying, don't talk that prosperity mess to me. But you know in your heart God says you're going to be blessed. There's no reason for you to be poor because somebody else wants to be poor. That's why the Bible says we have to come from among them. So Caleb, Caleb says, not only am I going to say it, I'm going to seize it. Now listen at this. Caleb was now 85 years old. He'd been walking with Moses and Joshua when Moses first told him, he was 40 years old, says, you are going to inherit the land that God has for you. 45 years old. And Caleb said, listen, y'all, I'm just as strong today as I was when Moses told me this stuff. How many of you know that the Lord is a keeper? The Lord will keep you. The Lord will preserve you. That's why if you have a vision... If you, have, if you know your purpose, you not only have to see it in the spirit, but you have to speak it with your mouth, and then you got to go seize it because sometimes we just keep talking about stuff and do nothing about it. Come on, somebody. So what he said to them was, here's what I want you to do. I want you to give me the mountain. Joshua, I know you love me. Joshua, I know we've been through a lot of battles together. Joshua, we've been in the wilderness together. There are others who died in the wilderness. There are others who didn't make it out simply because they didn't believe. But Joshua, I don't want you to pity me, or to, to pity me. I want you to be able to give me what's mine. If the mountain lot is mine, that's the one I'm going to take, and I'm going to take it from the Anakims because they are the big ones and because they're strong, because God has been with me and I have been with God. He said, I've wholly been with God all of this time. I have not sold God short. I remember when we had no water, God brought water out of rocks. I remember when we didn't have an army that God taught us how to fight. I remember when we needed food uh, that God rained down manna from heaven. I, I, I remember that I didn't have to buy new shoes and new sandals in the desert because God took care of us. I remember there was a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. There's no way I'm going back on God. Y'all can say what you want to, but I know what God has already promised me. There's no way I'm going to turn around. Y'all do what you got to do, but I'm going. So Caleb said, Joshua, don't go light on me because of my age. As a matter of fact, I'm probably just as strong as some of those 40-year-olds. But let me suggest to you right through here that don't let it, your age keep you from serving God. Yeah, just because you're 60 doesn't mean you can't serve God. Because you're retired doesn't mean you can't serve God. Because, Lordy, Lordy, you're now 40 doesn't mean you got to just draw back and do nothing. Now is the time. You, you know what God can do for you. You know what God has brought you through. You've seen him bring you out of danger. You've seen him heal people. You've seen him deliver. Now because you have a testimony, rather than backing up, you ought to be on the forefront. You ought to be like Caleb when he said, give me the mountain." I am a mountain fighter. So Caleb said, give me the mountain. And the Bible declares that Caleb went over and took the mountain. If you're taking notes today, I want you to write this down. That vision always comes before victory. Vision always comes before victory. The reason James says we do not have is because what? 
And maybe could it be that the reason we don't ask is because we can't see? Could it be that I don't ask God for the provisions for my vision because I don't see my vision? Could it be that I don't ask him because I have blocked vision? I am blinded. Paul was a good example of that. Paul was one who, in fact, went about the job of killing Christians. Amen. And when Paul went about killing Christians, his vision was to destroy them. But on his road, on the road to Damascus, he had an encounter with God and God blinded him. He fell from his beast, had to go down to a street called Straight. Ananias had to lay his hands on him before he could get sight again. The key point here is, unless you are blinded to the ways of the world, you will always look in that direction. But once God lays his hands on you, changes your sight, once you go blind to the world, you can see things his way. But you'll never see it or be able to say it until God has had an encounter with you. Now, Somebody's saying, but pastor, why, what do I need to say? What do I need to see? And why do I need to seize it? Well, first of all, you need to say what God has shown you. If God's shown you these things, say it, but then go after them. God does not give us dreams and visions for them to die on the vine. Amen. What are the steps then to saying it and then seizing it? And I'll get ready to take my seat. The first step to saying what you have to say is you have to have confidence that God has given you the dream. You have to believe that it came from God. If you don't believe it came from God, uh, then you won't hang on to it. Secondly, you have to have commitment. Many great dreams die because the dreamers lack the commitment to declare them. Other people cannot follow our inward hopes unless we are committed to it. Thirdly, we got to be able to communicate. We got to say what it is God has called us to do. But finally, you got to have some convictions. If you are not convicted about your purpose in life, any and everybody can draw you off course. Amen? If you don't want to live holy, almost anything will help you fall off the wagon. Do I have a witness in the house? But if you want to live holy and you have that conviction when the difficulties come, you'll say, no, I can't do that because my convictions require me that I walk where I am. But in, in, in order to seize it, you got to have discipline. And when you have discipline, you'll discover that God will give you the desires of your heart. I want to close when I tell you, and this is not one of those real emotional messages, because I want you to understand that we need to see something for God. We need to say what it is we see. Then we need to seize it for the kingdom. In our church meeting last night, I shared with those who were here what is for me or would be for me the greatest nightmare that I could possibly have. And that is to stand before God and God say to me, you know, I gave you a vision. I told you how to say it, but you never seized it. And because you never seized it, people who could have been saved were lost. People who could have been healed six months earlier were not healed because you didn't seize the moment. People whose marriages could have been brought back together stayed apart in agony because you didn't seize the word that I told you to pass out. My nightmare would be that God would say to me, I told you what to do. I purposed it in your heart. I gave you the ability to do it. And you did not do it. And because you did not do it, others suffered. What will it be like to stand before God 
And God said to you, I have laid out for you not only comfort for you and your family, but for those around you, for your siblings and others, but because you would not seize it. It never came to fruition. What will you do as a minister if God says to you, I told you to preach, and though the preaching was difficult, and they didn't shout, and they didn't run, but because somebody heard my spirit, their life was turned around. They were saved, but you didn't do it, so they died without me because you didn't seize it. What will it be like if God speaks to us says to us, I told you that your job was to be in the area of helps. That that was the, what I purposed you for. That's what I made you for. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew I saw you in the helps, but because you chose to disobey me, some people's lives had to be rearranged. What? A nightmare. To have to stand before God and say, God, I saw it, I said it, but I failed to seize it. I was afraid, God. I was afraid somebody was going to talk about me. God, I was really afraid that I might not be accepted. I might not get the promotion. I might not. I might not. But how many of you know? That if God says for you to do something, he's going to protect you while you're doing it. How many of you know that even if it costs you, because one way or the other it's going to cost you, you're going to have to pay the price because Jesus paid the price. How many people here in this city could be saved if in fact we were witnessing Many people on your job wouldn't have headaches if you were, in fact, doing what God had told you to do. I'm not talking about taking time away from your job to do witnessing and that kind of stuff because I don't think that's right either. I think we ought to be good living witnesses on the job, but when we're on the job, we're there to work in a godly manner. Amen? Amen. What are we going to tell God? When God said, I showed you that you were to be in the ministry of helps. And you said, but God, that's not one of the popular ministries. That's not one of the ministries that gets notoriety. That's not one of the ministries that's on television. That's not one of the ministries that people shout about. That's not one of the ministries that you even get recognition on. God, I don't want that one, so I want to do something else. Although I'm talented to do many things, my calling is in the helps. But now, because I want to do something differently, the person who needed the help the most didn't get it. And you were the instrument chosen to give it. How many of us? And I'm almost through. How many of us? When we take inventory of our lives, have to say like Isaiah, Woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a person of unclean lips. I live among people of the same. But whatever you want me to do, God, I'll do it. We've got to be able to know our purpose. Say it and then seize it. And I close when I tell you this. That Caleb wasn't the first one to, thought this, to think this. God was the originator of this whole three-word saying. Say it, see it, say it, and seize it. God saw the whole universe in his mind, in his power, long before he divided the night from the darkness, I mean from the light, long before he made the rivers and the seas, long before he made the bird, the fish, and the fowls. He had it already in his mind. He knew what he wanted the sea to look like. He knew what he wanted oak trees to look like. He knew what he wanted pine trees to look like. He knew what he wanted cedar trees to look like. He knew what he wanted 
grass to look like. He knew what he wanted roses and daffodils to look like. He knew it. But then he spoke it. And the Bible says, and God said, and it was. He said, let there be light. And there was light. He said, let the fish and the fowls be, and they were. He saw it. He said it. But then, when it came to man, he says, we got to seize him. He said, come let us make man in our own likeness and in our own image. So what he did, James Weldon Johnson says, he hovered over the clay like a mother over a child. And he formed us and he shaped us. Then he brew into our nostrils the breath of life and we became a living soul. God seized what he had said and what he saw. If God sees what he says and he will seize that, how much differently than we uh, should we be? I'm through. I want you to soberly think about what God has called you to do. If you don't think and you don't know what God's called you to do, everybody will tell you what God has called you to do. Am I, am I right? Everybody will tell you. They'll make something up for you. Bo, you ought to be this, that, the other. And my heart today is that we will hear from God and that we will let him speak to our minds and our hearts. And then we will seize it. Before you were born, God knew what you were to be. But the question is, do you know what you're to be? And there are a lot of things you can be and still not be what God has purposed you to be. God... What must I say when I've seen what you've called me to be? And how must I seize the moment? Everybody who would ever become anything for the kingdom of God must first sell out 100% to God. My heart's desire for Zion is that we walk in the perfect will of God. And how do we do that? We study his word, we let him talk to us. And we correct the things that we see that are wrong. We teach the children. We become involved in our community. And we don't stay silent when we see wrong. God, everybody's head bowed. Everybody's eyes closed. God, you see us. You see us with our heads bowed and You see us as we really are going to become. You don't see us with all of our fallacies and with all, we, all of our weaknesses. You don't see us with all of our mistakes and all of our little idiosyncrasies. But you see us in your ultimate purpose. Now, God, because you see us like that, help us to see ourselves like that. Give us the same eyes you have. Give us the same heart you have. God, for so long we've wronged you, and 
We've gone about doing things in our own way. And we simply say today, we've got to see ourselves as you see us. We've got to hear your heart beat and not be persuaded otherwise. God, somebody that even has their head bowed now is worried about what's going to happen when they leave this house of worship. They're concerned about tomorrow and the next day and the next and the next. But help them live for the moment. Your grace is sufficient. Help them to know that they can do all things through you. But it's important that they have you. Not a semblance of you. Not religion. Not tradition. But you. The real you. The purifying you. The loving you, the nurturing, compassionate you that cares about our every breath, that has numbered every hair on our head, has ordered our steps in your word, the one who takes care of us at night while we sleep and slumber. It's you, God, that has brought us through all the things we've endured. And we want to turn our hearts to you and proclaim that we want to see it your way. Say it with your authority and seize it for your glory. God, help us. Help us to see it, say it, and to seize it. Amen. I want everybody to repeat after me. I will see it, then I will say it, and by God's grace, I will seize it. I refuse to continue without him. In Jesus' name, amen. If there's anyone in the house today that would give his or her life to Christ, I want you to come. I want you to understand that you can say, God, I can see myself beyond all my troubles with your help. I can see myself not serving the enemy any longer. I can see myself overcoming I can see myself with a whole new attitude, the whole new perspective on life. God, I can see you working in my life. If that's you, I want you to come. One of the things that God does so readily is he forgives us of our sins and washes us and the Bible declares though your sins be as scarlet he'll make you as white as snow that's his promise if that's you I want you to come don't be afraid or ashamed get up from where you are and see yourself in the perfect will of God saying I'm his child and I belong to him and him alone. Thank you so much for watching today. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, now is a good time. Just simply say, Lord, I believe you died for me while I was yet a sinner. I commit my life to you for the rest of my life and accept God as your Savior and as your Lord. And do know when you accept him as Lord and Master, he will do great things in your life. God bless you. Thank you again. And we'll see you soon, if not sooner.